Hello, I'm Pete Lyons and I am here today with Robert Jordan. Uh, Robert is the Director of Engineering here at Gaia. Robert, thanks for joining us. Um, you. Can you tell us just basically what, what Gaia is for folks who are unfamiliar? Gaia is a subscription video on demand service. So we have long form format media that members subscribe to and we deliver primarily through uh, a variety of devices, whether it's a web application, tvOS, iOS, Roku, Android, um, or Fire TV. And so we have about 7,000 titles that are focused on what we term transformational media. It's an alternative uh, form of media, not traditional, but it covers things like yoga, meditation, uh, personal transformation, or things like Seeking Truth, which could include uh, ancient uh, civilizations or conspiracy theories. So tell us a little bit about your role here as Director of Engineering. Well, as Head of Engineering, we have uh, multiple products and teams. Uh, we have a web application, iOS, tvOS, Roku, and also the Android platform. So my team essentially develops the product for each one of those platforms, native applications, of course, as well as web applications, and we also design and deliver the infrastructure that powers all of those applications, along with QA that goes along with the process. Okay. Um, so we've just done a major product update to all most of those products that you just mentioned. So take us through the story of that from before the major project was started. So what was the situation that sort of motivated this big this big overhaul? Um, what was the status of the business like? The status of the product? you know, at, at the beginning of the project. Yeah, we really outgrew the current platform. It was a monolithic PHP stack built on Drupal 6. So anytime you want to do anything, whether it was modify an API or update a user interface on the web application, you had to go to this, this one system. Uh, we also had needs for marketing to be able to take and create landing pages or really to be able to control and self-serve what they needed inside of their business to generate um, um, uh, campaigns and such to attract members. Um, and it was really clear based upon the growth that we were projecting for the company. You know, we're hundreds of thousands of users today. We're moving to millions of users in a few years. The business is rapidly growing. So things like scalability just simply weren't in the product. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the ability for marketing to do self-serve wasn't there. And quite frankly, moving into markets um, that we're in today, but we're not internationalized or we don't have local content. So that's a big emphasis for internationalization with inside of, inside of our product. So as this uh, effort is kicking off, what are those some the very initial steps? You know, we know we've we've done a lot of work now in this in this last you know eighteen months or so. Um, but at the very beginning, well, how do you start? You know, you know, you know, you need to scale. You know, you need to make you know some some large scale changes. What's the first thing that you start to work on? What's always interesting about a new project like this, it was really a greenfield opportunity for us. So um, the engineers are always excited, right? Because they get a chance to evaluate and select new technologies. And so we went down the road and it was not only uh, from a back-end perspective, but it was also obviously from a web app perspective. And so the two systems really needed to work very well together. Node was the basis of what we selected for uh, the platform and the architecture. Uh, on the back-end side of things, we decided to go down an Amazon Web Services route uh, using things like uh, Cassandra, Kafka, um, and a variety of other technologies in that ecosystem. On the web app side of things, we decided to build an architecture based upon React. And one of the key needs that we had inside of that was to make sure that we could satisfy our SEO requirements and fulfill those uh, from a business perspective. Because as I mentioned, the web application services both some of our marketing and all of our product needs. And, and as you would expect, you know, you go through the evaluation of the different technologies, you make decisions, and then you turn around and say, okay, who has the knowledge of any of these? And we all looked around at each other, and guess what? We didn't have the domain knowledge. So a big learning experience for us, um, but we were able to hire some really bright and smart people. We figured things out, and we got going. Um, and it was really a matter of, once you get into an environment, it's establishing, for example, the patterns that you want to use, not only in the code, but also more importantly in the processes that you use. As an example, after I get done with a piece of code and I check it in, what's the process for pulling that through and getting it deployed to production? So working agreements and such were, were a real key piece of what we did um, in, in building this new architecture and getting it going. 
So tell us a bit about your decision-making process for buy versus build versus open source and commercial offerings as you combine all the available technologies to put together a, an integrated product. It's funny, you'd think after all this time I'd be able to pull out a, a flow chart and a process to show you the build versus buy decision. Um, and you know, it's interesting, at this point in my career, things become intuitive when you take a look at, for example, what are the business needs and requirements? And so we knew up front that we had a smaller team. We're not the size of Netflix, although we, we have a reasonable size engineering uh, staff as well as for DevOps. And in going into that, we realized for us to be able to manage all of the individual components was probably something that we didn't need to do, although we did start out that way. So not only in using AWS just and, 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 and spinning up basically servers and us installing things like Kafka and Cassandra and then trying to manage that um, was the initial route that, that we went down. And that's, I think, more of a, of a build versus buy decision. And it's really interesting as, as we've gotten into this, we've learned from that and, and having a smaller type of team, we realized that um, where's our, our emphasis best placed? So developers need to develop and develop new features. Do they need to spend time um, trying to figure out why a seed node just simply disappeared in Cassandra? Or do, do we want to deliver a new feature for that day? So it's very clear that while we've started on AWS, we need to really take advantage of more and more of the managed services that are on that platform. So for us, it's, it, it started as a, a buy decision, and I'm sorry, a build decision, and it's really turned into a buy decision. So as you made this transition, was there anything that had a particularly steep learning curve or was there a surprising outcome of any of these, uh, these transitions? Wow, you know that saying, you don't know what you don't know? That really applied here because we selected a set of technologies that we didn't have the domain experience for. And so we went off in a direction trying to implement this and we really had some significant problems. Um, you know, the, the day that we decided to do our, our initial dry run for the, for the rollout of the web application, it, it was really funny because our DevOps engineers um, got together and they sat down and they said, okay, let's figure out how to back up and, and, and uh, restore Cassandra. And I looked at them and I said, I thought you guys already knew how to do this. And they're like, no, we're going to try to figure it out now. And uh, it, it became very clear that the, the type of knowledge that you need to have, you mentioned the build versus buy decision before, if you're going to build this thing, you have to have very, very specific domain knowledge. And I think for us, what it was is that we knew that, but we didn't know that. And then we figured it out, figured out what we really needed to know. It was an eye opener for us. Um, one of the uh, amazing outcomes that we had in launching the project, um, on the SEO side of things, um, it's typically well known that when you move a, an architecture as big as this, so from old to new, you typically take a pretty significant hit when it relates to the SEO and the rankings and such. Um, but our SEO team felt as if that was something that didn't need to have happen. And inside of this, uh, the development process for the web app and the architecture, we took painstakingly care to build in everything that we could with SEO, all the best practices that we knew, and some that we didn't know, but we made some guesses on. So the time that we rolled out the, the web application was, was quite amazing to us. We didn't take a hit. In fact, our rankings started jumping up from, from the initial launch. And more importantly, uh, on a subscription-based service, your conversions are, are extremely important. Um, we doubled our conversion rate in the cart, and one of the main reasons why is that we were, we were now a mobile-friendly site. So people could do the transaction from their mobile device and do it in a way that was very conducive from a user experience. So um, the teams have been extremely happy with the launch of the web application and the outcomes of that because it's just more money in the bank for us. Okay, so to follow up on that, you know, you said the front end is now based in, in React and you said you've gotten great SEO out of this. And I think that's kudos to the front end engineering team because React is not something that uh, is optimized for search engine optimization and uh, Facebook doesn't even do it. You know, Facebook is a walled garden that um, is not really concerned about search engines. Um, and so here's something where you've taken uh, an open source framework um, you know, leverage all the capabilities you get out of the box, but then your engineering team has to really do some heavy lifting to make it do something that it doesn't do out of the box. Um, 
with that same technology, thinking about the end user experience, let's talk about how the end user experience on the, in the web app side is now versus on the previous stack. The old web app um, was built upon the traditional models where a user takes an action, a page loads. And we always knew that the promises of a single page application were really where we wanted to go. Um, but the old platform just really didn't allow us to get there. So like with everything else, you know, when we did the evaluation of, of the different JavaScript frameworks that were available, you know, Angular and React were really the two big ones. Um, there was more of an emphasis with React when it came to server-side rendering, and we knew from the, the ability of, um, or the, the inability of, of Google to really read JavaScript and know what the code is supposed to do, um, we knew we needed to deliver a fully rendered page to the browser or to the bot. And that's not an easy thing to do. Um, there were some basic projects that you could download uh, with React and get going with, uh, there were some best practices that we found when you Googled, but in general, there wasn't anything that really fit our model. So we took what we could find, we built to the point of where when you Googled, you couldn't find the answer anymore, and then we developed our own best practices around how to create an environment that satisfied both the product needs, the user experience needs, and also the needs for Google. So the initial page load, satisfies both Google the bots, right, and also the user, and then any subs subsequent um, page loads or actions that happen uh, act like an SBA, and it's a great experience for the end user as well. So the, the promise and the, and the delivery, um, the promise was there, we were able to deliver on it, but the path to get there was significant, and you'd always hear about how universal JavaScript was the panacea, and potentially, yeah, there's these pitfalls, but no one would really describe what they were. We found all of them, and then some, found solutions to just about all of them, and it's just impressive the, the, the work that the, the front end engineering team did on this particular project. So back on the subject of process, uh, walk us through how a new idea for a feature gets from an idea all the way out to end users. So features get from product, through the product development process, and into engineering. And so we do product ideation. And ideas can come from really anybody in the business. Um, obviously, product is responsible for driving that process. But an engineer, as an example, might see something and say, hey, uh, I've noticed this, the way this feature works, and I think we can do a better way. Or a marketing individual might, might say that, you know, I've done some testing, done a bit of basic research, and I'd like to pursue this particular feature in the product. So as I mentioned, we have a product team that's responsible for that. And there's a lot of techniques that you can use to do product ideation. But once it, it exit, that exits that process um, and it gets put into the product backlog, essentially you follow that through the estimation process, the refinement, um, and then into planning. So um, a group of uh, stories will make it into a sprint, um, and then out the other side comes a potentially shippable increment of our product. Uh, sometimes it's a feature-based um, idea, so it takes multiple sprints to get through that um, before we can really deliver um, on, on the entire feature for this for the particular um, end user or set of end users that we're targeting. So it really is a collective effort of everybody in the organization. So how does uh, DevOps and rapid delivery play into this process? As you would expect, it is a critical piece of, of the delivery of the software. and. Um, you know, when you take a look at DevOps in general, I think we went through uh, multiple iterations before we ended up where we're at now. And, and DevOps is a, a state of mind. And what I mean by that is that, depending upon the individual and their background and their experiences, uh, each person or team have very different ways of how they think DevOps should operate. Um, and so initially, I think our approach in, in taking DevOps in, in a way, making it a walled garden where we defined interfaces between the development team and the DevOps team to make sure that, that software was tightly controlled, uh, environments were tightly controlled, and that we could prevent things from failing in the environment. And what we realized by doing that was we really broke down the communication between our engineers and, and the DevOps folks um, Part of this was personality-based, 
Other parts were, were just simply, we were used to an environment that went down a lot, so we couldn't afford for this new stack, this new infrastructure to go down or have a perception of going down. And as we've, we've, um, we've iterated through this process now, it's really clear for us that it is, it is truly a blending or melding of both of the teams, whereas the engineers, especially on the infrastructure side of things that are developing the microservices or macro services as we initially have done, um, it's, it's really having them be highly integrated in to the DevOps processes and vice versa, to have the DevOps engineers be highly integrated into the, to the infrastructure team or even the web app team because they have a build process as well to be able to deploy our web app software. So in doing so, I think there's a lot of uh, ways to leverage each other and, and truly embrace collaboration versus these walled gardens. How do you feel the engineering team itself has transformed during this process? It's significant. And in fact, we talk about engineering and the transformation within that group, but quite frankly, it's been an organizational transformation. Um, we started this project um, over a year ago, and at that time, we also uh, embraced the principles of Agile and Scrum. So not only did we bring up new architectures and new processes, in the way of developing our code, but we also did the same thing organizationally. So fundamental concepts like velocity and story points and estimating uh, were brand new to the team. And so the outcomes or the benefits of that have been throughout the entire organization. There's a lot of personal um, responsibility, a lot of accountability, and it's amazing to see even the executive level talk about how much this has impacted our organization. And quite frankly, it has impacted our bottom line in a very significant way, as I mentioned before, in the way of increased rankings. Um, obviously, organic is always good because you have to pay to, to uh, acquire subscribers in the way of uh, conversions in our shopping cart. So um, it, it's, it's been a significant overall change for just not only engineering, but for the whole organization. So you mentioned expanding into additional markets. What else is next on the roadmap? It's a great question. Um, you know, the old adage, if you didn't do it right the first time, then, then do it again. Um, in a lot of respects, we're, we took a really hard look at the architecture and where we're at after this, this first large iteration of, our, of, of the project. And what we realized is that given some business factors, as in looking at what headcounts might, might be uh, two or three years from now, uh, looking at the, the people and the domain knowledge that we have, it was very clear that moving from us managing our systems to move to, to into an, an environment where we're using managed services. So good example would be today we use Cassandra, um, and it absolutely is the Ferrari of, of data stores that are out there, distributed data stores. Uh, we realized that although it is great to have, um, we're probably gonna trade the Ferrari in for the Toyota because we don't need that much power today. And so using technologies like DynamoDB as an example, um, as an alternative, um, is something that we're, we're pursuing. So we're definitely getting much more into all of the goodies that, that AWS provides in the way of DynamoDB, in the way of Kinesis, we're currently using Kafka, but migrating to Kinesis. Things like Lambda. Uh, Lambda make it very easy to do some pub, sub, or um, uh, consumer, producer type of concepts. Um, very easy and out of the box. So do we have our teams focus on tuning Cassandra or literally going to an interface and spinning up uh, a DynamoDB instance to be able to take and utilize it with our architecture. So it's much more of that. And, and in many respects, we're doing another redesign of the architecture and moving from what we thought were microservices that were really macro services to a true microservices architecture. Robert, this has been great. Thanks so much for spending time with us this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, Pete. Thanks.